thanks again, Nathan. Um, try and do this so I don't write. Just a couple, first, uh, first off, a couple quick acknowledgements. Um, someone shared with me today that it's a, it's a Métis week here in Alberta. So if you get a chance, get out, kiss a Métis. It's, a, it's always a good thing. I know there's a couple uh, lucky recipients in here that might be interested. As well, uh, the elder Heather uh, wanted to thank her for her words in many ways, and also uh, Peggy, I think it was. Um, a lot of my presentation is actually going to be speaking on very similar aspects that they, they spoke about as well. I should have actually called it or labeled it relationship building and engagement as opposed to uh, consultation through engagement. Um, I'll touch on consultation. Um, but watching uh, uh, Vince in the hot seat there, I think I'll, uh, I'll avoid some aspects of that. <laughs> um. Okay, Nathan. <laughs> okay, all right. So can I just press that? Yeah, yeah, yeah oh. you can press down. Okay. Okay. One small success. I'm going to be sharing a lot of failures today, so that, that success is good. Um, I'll be speaking and elaborating on, on a lot of things on, on, from, my, from my experience. Um, so, um, my in interest today is providing you with some insights that can assist you dealing with Aboriginal issues that come up in forestry. Um, as I mentioned, um, consultation is a small aspect of it. From my perspective, I wanted to share some ideas that can, you can carry with you. Uh, from, from my perspective, I think everyone has a, a role to play. Um, you're all advocates in this area. You guys are all familiar with that. You, you, you have to take some ownership in things, and it helps foster uh, better business capabilities and, and move, move your company forward, move, move your professionally, professionally and personally. Personally and professionally. I want you to think throughout the conversation, perhaps you're having a coffee chat with a friend or attending a sporting event or sitting around the table having a, having a meal, a nice meal with your family and Aboriginal relations or Aboriginal issues come up, that, that often happens. It can be sometimes you know, filled with a lot of sensitivities and I'll share with you some of, the, some of my experiences as well. But how you address those things have long, long lasting impacts on where you go professionally, personally. And in many cases, it relies on, it's reliant on you to correct that record. Um, so I've got two computers going on here. I wanna make sure I get the few things. So just the point on consultation, from my experience, it's been similar throughout Canada. I've worked um, everywhere from BC out to the East Coast, up into the Arctic, working not primarily forestry but oil and gas. So some of that, per some of the perspective comes from that, from that, uh, from that area. I put that uh, that um, picture up there. I wanted to share with you some of the similarities I see when I talk about when we talk about consultation and I talk about the similarities. I'm talking about what's the foundational aspect of consultation. It's about relationship building. It's not, a, it's not necessarily about the, the administrative or procedural uh, aspects that are delegated out. And that, you know, that's one way of dealing with it, but at the core are the beliefs and values that you imbue to get, move things forward to get that approval or to move things forward to have a stronger relationship with that community, developing success for both of you, both the community and industry. Um, that picture comes from Millbrook, Millbrook First Nation, um, in terms, and it speaks a lot to me for, of, of uh, the similarities you'll see. Um, I don't know if you, how many of you are familiar with mannerisms throughout, uh, throughout Aboriginal communities. One of the things that Aboriginal peoples tend to do a lot of is point with their lips. And the, I've seen this, and I've gone down to Muscogee for, for powwows. I've been up to, to in northern BC through Saskatchewan. And I've seen these posters all over. It's not the same poster, it's always hand-drawn, but it just shows you know, that there is a lot of similarities and it speaks to those values. Oh, before I go back, is anyone familiar with what SLO stands for? Anyone? No? Bueller? No. 
SLO stands for social license to operate, and, and from my view, that is, a, that is a tool that you can utilize to try and move forward on approvals. In my view as well, it's not very effective. There are more effective tools out there. I'll, I'll allude to them. Peggy alluded to them earlier in her presentation. But social license op, uh, operate, I think you can remove that from your, from your terminology. It's, it's not useful. So um, acronyms in general are useless, so that you can get rid of that one. So what do I mean by when, what do I mean by when I talk about relationship building? And intuitively, you guys are all familiar with these things. You guys are also familiar with the term, you know, as long as the grass, as long as the sun shines, the water flows and the grass grows. I, who who knows where that comes from? And none of the ringers that uh, know exactly where that comes from can can throw up their hand. Anyone? Anyone? It comes from a lot of the treaties that you see. So when I was working at Treaty Eight for uh, First Nations of Alberta. That was one thing that we often said. It, it is some of the introductory language that you find in all the treaties. And it's a good premise um, for relationship building as well. How is this important to uh, not only industry but to Aboriginal communities? When you talk about Aboriginal communities, you know that they tend to be a communal society uh, with an oral history. And, and what way? better to translate or move uh, oral history forward is other than talking. You gotta talk to each other and that's the premise of behind all relationships. On a note on positions, interests, we all tend to retreat into areas of strength when we're cornered or we wanna address something, it become very positional. In many, in many ways, these positions are unassailable. So what would be an Aboriginal um, community's uh, position? It would tend to be falling back into Aboriginal rights. What, what does industry put out? I'm sure you guys have all, all talked about this. We talk about regulatory requirements. We talk about going back into those uh, timelines. We're stuck on a timeline. Vince alluded to them as well. That, you know, that tends to be our position, and that sets us up for conflict. So how do we get away from that so that we can come to, if it's an approval we're seeking, or if we're looking at developing a stronger relationship to eventually work with the community, how do we get there? We want to create areas of interest or look at areas of interest that will support us in making that happen. Some areas of intersection that like to talk about, and you guys are all very familiar with these, so I won't dwell on them uh, too much, but you're all familiar, you guys all have economic development opportunities that you're looking at working with the communities. For example, you've probably got uh, Aboriginal contractors working for you right now, uh, doing some harvesting activities. You're looking at education and training opportunities with those communities, looking at recruitment. I've seen many of your faces at, uh, at career fairs that we attend. All those things are important as well, and I, I called it that culturally appropriate agreements, that ties in as well. We call it culturally appropriate agreements simply because there's so many different terms for agreements, be they impact benefit agreements or comprehensive land claims, things of that nature, but they all speak to the same thing. Wanting to have a good relationship with the community, woven into that is the relationship and engagement aspect. So where can we find some common ground? One of the things I think that forestry hasn't done um, overly well is illustrate and demonstrate areas of alignment, essentially tooting our own horn. I look at, uh, and by a show of hands, everyone's heard of uh, uh, seven generations, right? Looking ahead seven generations, a forecasting model. That's, a, that's a actually one of those aspects where I talk about similarities. That's actually an Iroquois legend where the community would move forward, looking forward, seven generations. Anyone know how long seven generations is? No, 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 one, no suggestions? Sorry? Close, but not quite. Depends on how you look at the, uh, how, you, how you look at generations. It's actually roughly around 200 years. And how long is our timber supply analysis models? 200 years. And I think forestry is in a unique position 
to look at those things in terms of a similarity. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity that we don't, we don't talk about this and share that we're looking that far ahead. I've seen in the, in the past where um, we just don't have those areas of interest and this will give you a kind of a foundation to work from. I won't t dwell on the fire too much because I know that Pat is going to go into that uh, uh, quite a bit. Other than the, the painting that you see there, that was actually done in, I think, 1897, and that was done around Washington, and that's uh, direct evidence of, uh, of fire being utilized to, uh, for societal practices. Um, you often hear the adage, you know, that burning promotes wall wildlife, and there's a lot of, a lot of truth to that. We use that. We use the similar principles in harvesting because to res represent, resemble, sorry, fire characteristics. A really important aspect that shows common interest. Once again, Peggy stole my my thunder, so I won't uh, get into the uh, undrip uh, undrip too much. One thing I do want to share, though, is it's. A very important piece in the, the forest, uh, Forestry Stewardship Council certification. Alpac is proud to have, have that certification. And uh, it's important to know that FPIC is a big component of that. We've talked about how the federal government is committed to implementing it. Um, currently, there's, I think, three governments, three countries that have implemented it into their constitution. I think Bolivia is one of them, two others in South or Central America. And to, has it markedly improved the livelihood of the uh, Aboriginal communities. I would argue that it hasn't. However, I think it is something to aspire to. And that, that is one criticism, unfortunately, of, of UNDRIP, is that it's an aspirational document, but I think it is, it is a positive direction to get move us in, in that, moving us forward in time to uh, reconcile issues. And I'll get into the reconciliation points here shortly. One aspect I did want to touch on FPIC, because it's going to continue to be an important piece for all of us to deal with and address. And if I could distill it down to one sentence, I, and I heard this quote um, somewhere, and I thought it was really telling, is that I would say that FPIC is not the absence of no, it is a presence of yes. So when we're looking to get um, an approval or work with the community to, to uh, essentially harvest in an area. It, we're not talking about consent so much as getting us all on side and collaborating on, on something that moves us both forward in a, in a positive sense. Going back to that, the reconciliation aspect, I mean, it, it comes down to establishing and maintaining good, strong relationships. Relationship building plays a, a strong role in, in, in reconciliation and efforts to play, um, play into building those strong relationships. You're probably wondering what's that, what that picture is, who that guy is. That's uh, Premier Stephen McNeil. I wanted to share that with you because he said something that was really uh, telling to me and I think it really speaks to where we're going as a nation and I, it, it came out of, out of the dark for me and I was quite impressed with it. He was at a you know, function similar to this. He was talking to a bunch of uh, delegates on, on some matter, it doesn't matter what, and it doesn't matter what the political stripe of what the conversation was. However, what ended up happening is uh, several protesters came in the community, into the, into the uh, function and started protesting. They're protesting an issue around a project in the area called the Alton Gas Project. However, um, uh, Stephen McNeil, the premier, actually didn't confront them, but he, he, you know, he did say, "I accept your concerns. We're working on things." And he came out with the current comment, "We are all treaty people." I thought that was very poignant because it is true. We're all treaty people. We all intuitively know that. It's, it's as, as Peggy mentioned, it's enshrined in the Constitution, Section uh, 35, and it's it's important for us to be aware of that that we're all working towards that test of reconciliation. And he embodied that on that day. I thought it was very important. Uh, to conclude, I wanted to just touch on something completely unrelated and see how it works. And I've been talking a lot about relationship building. Does anyone know who that, who that gent on, that old gent with the ukulele is? 
Warren Buffett has got a net worth of about $84 billion, throws out you know, billions of dollars each year in charitable donations. But what's his measure of success? His, essentially, his measure of success comes down to not the money that he's made, it's about the relationships he's built, the love he has for each other. And I think that's very telling for us. And then draw it back into ours, similarly working into what we do. Working with Aboriginal communities would deem successful if we have a positive building, uh, working relationship. And we benefit when we work together. Our, uh, when we take ownership of that, when we've sewn and woven in Aboriginal relations into the fabric of everything we do from a day-to-day -day basis, I could say we'd be deemed successful. And uh, I guess one final note is uh, one thing I didn't really dwell on, but it, it is very uh, relevant in that at this point is that it's it's a scalable initiative. It's a scalable um, tool. So not only are you talking to on that day-to-day -day individual interactions with uh, with a community member, you can also take that and broaden it to the community, to the leadership in the community, and that helps you breed success. That thank you.